Hello, I'm Lee Baker, co-president of Atheists United, and I'm delighted to have as my guest this afternoon one of our own, a member of our group who is a professor at a local university, and he is a very uh, involved student in the Bible and archaeology and related matters. I asked him if he would come today and tell us about the first part of the Bible, which is the Torah. And so nice to have you, Stephen. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Stephen Morris. Delighted to be here. And uh, now you're the expert on this, on this, and uh, I was, we had conversation before, and it was so informative and intriguing that that's why you, I asked to share it with the audience. So um, now, can you tell us exactly what Torah refers to? Okay, the Torah refers to the first five books of what the Christians refer to as the Old Testament. Uh, the in actual phrase, the Old Testament, is actually a bit of a put down for the Jewish Bible because the Christian attitude is, well, we now have a New Testament. God has spoken again. So we've got that Old Testament. And when it's convenient, of course, the Christians will take the Old Testament very seriously. But when it's inconvenient, they can always say, well, that's just the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament consists of, of three sections, the first section being the Torah, which we can talk about this afternoon, and those are the first five books of the Bible uh, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. You said three. What are the okay. other two? You have the Torah, two, then you've got two more. Yes. The Jews refer to their uh, Bible as the Tanakh. The T stands for Torah. The N stands for the Nevim, or the Prophets and all churches have always been interested in prophets. <laughs> and the uh, third section, you're not laughing at my jokes. <laughs> no, well, you It's not much of a joke. You cue me when it's funny. When it's funny, I'll let all you right. know. All okay. right, you know, we don't have an applause sign either, so you'll have to. <laughs> and the third section is uh, the K of the Tanakh is the Ketuvim, or the writings, which is a real grab bag, Job and Ecclesiastes and all the others. Mm -hmm. So those are the three sections of the Old Testament as the uh, Jews look at it, and the first section is the Torah. Now, is the Torah the part that's considered actual word of God? Well, uh, again, this is, depends on which religious person you, you talk to. The fundamentalist Christian view is that the uh, Torah uh, was actually written by Moses, mm -hmm. which is rather peculiar because it starts with Genesis and goes all the way up uh, through the uh, story of Moses to uh, Moses' death, burial, and what happened after Moses had died. Oh. Now, this causes a little bit of a problem when you say that Moses actually wrote this. But uh, if you're a fundamentalist, you can believe this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he, his hand extended out of the grave and wrote things, or if he just had a premonition as to what would happen after his death. Uh, you can ask a fundamentalist, not me. He might have had a psychic, you know, that was channeling. <laughs> this channeling could be true. I, from you'd ha, you'd from have, the other side. The other side. You'd have to ask a fundamentalist. I don't know how they get around that explanation. Okay. Um, now tell me, why, oh, I wanted to ask you about the writings. Now, are those considered to be writings by various people? Yes, they were written by various people at various times. Normally, we don't even know the authors of these writings. A lot of them have been ascribed to Solomon, for example, Ecclesiastes. They say, oh, King Solomon wrote that. Even though there's internal evidence that it was not written by Solomon, they still ascribe it to these famous people. Most of the writings, such as the Book of Job and Ecclesiastes and the Psalms, we have no idea who wrote them. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the Psalms, it starts out, uh, the writings of King Lemuel. Well, there was never any King Lemuel of uh, Israel. This is uh, the writings of someone who was not even Jewish, and yet it's now part of the, uh, the Old Testament as mm -hmm. part of the inspired prophecies. Now, why Jehovah would bother to transmit something to the Jews by first giving it to someone of a completely different religion is just one of those little puzzles. <laughs> we get, we, we'll, see, we'll see some of those inconsistencies sure. in the, as we go along in this conversation. So in other words, it's understood then and accepted that those writings were by human beings. But the fundamentalist would say, inspired by God. Inspired the humans by God. were just little right. pens that managed That's to write right. these Automatic things out. Automatic writing. Automatic writing. Some form writing. like that. Mm. Now, um, 
atheists uh, have a problem with uh, the Bible, and if, if we think some of the things are kind of obviously even silly. Mm -hmm. But why are we so concerned about? Well, we're concerned because everybody else is concerned. We can read uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and just look on it as very valuable writings from ancient times. But millions of Americans insist that the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, are pure and noble and should be taken as guidebooks for human behavior and understanding of the past. And if you actually look at what the Bible has said, a lot of it is incredibly cruel, uh, much of it is nonsensical, and some of it is just false. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I think atheists should do is simply present the Bible to Christians who are insisting that we live by it and say, well, you never read these passages. Your Bible study classes are actually just Christian indoctrination classes where they focus you in on only those bits of the Bible that they want you to believe, and they ignore all the nonsense. Mm -hmm. Well, here's some of the nonsense. Take the entire Old Testament, mm -hmm. including the Torah, mm -hmm. and then make some judgments as to whether you can okay, believe it well, or not. Okay, well, now, could you give me some blatant examples of nonsense? Okay, well, I happen to have some right here. I was sure you would. I'm sure you would. <laughs> uh, for one thing, in um, uh, Genesis chapter 6, a wonderful, uh, interesting passage, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now that's in the Bible talking about the sons of God having sex with, with uh, human women. This is like the Olympian gods in having a polytheistic religion in another part outside of the... Um, the um, Roman gods. And, the Roman gods and, also. And then the Hawaiian gods not only had sex with humans, they had sex with animals as well. You can get away with that if you're a god. <laughs> but here we have polytheism in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. where the Bible is talking about the existence of many gods. Mm -hmm. In fact, outside of the Torah, in another part of the Old Testament, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 11, the Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. Now here's Jehovah, who is going to starve a bunch of other gods. Mm -hmm. So when people say, oh, well, we have the three great monotheistic religions in uh, the world, mm -hmm. these are not monotheistic. Uh, Christianity and Judaism consider these passages to be true, and yet these passages talk about the existence of many gods. Many gods. Another example of nonsense, something from science, in Leviticus uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 20, here's a passage. All fowls, that's birds, all fowls that creep, going upon all four, shall be an abomination unto you. Well, there are no birds that go on all four. They hop on two feet. There are no four-legged birds. Mm -hmm. Here we have the Bible simply spouting nonsense. As far as morality is concerned, here's a piece of um, rather remarkable morality. And Miriam and Aaron. Is this where the family values come okay, from? Okay, some. Okay, here are some really good family values here. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, actually that's just being polite. If the word is actually slave, she shall not go out as the men servants do. Again, slaves. This is in Exodus chapter twenty-one, verse seven. Here we have a passage instructing men on the proper procedures for selling their daughters into slavery. Now, I do not consider slavery to be a traditional family value. In fact, I think it's horrible. And yet, there's nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament that slavery is condemned. Mm -hmm. I'll give you another. Yes? Well, you know, the later, tra uh, wh which is it? The King James. The King James Version. Cleaned up the language. Yes. And instead of saying slaves, they said Man servants, servants and maid servants. Right. Although the Old Testament word for slave sometimes is used for other positions. So with the Old Testament, sometimes it's a little bit tough. But mm -hmm. clearly, in this passage, where mm -hmm. the word sell is unambiguous, it's, that's right. he's a man. Here's how you sell your daughter into slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's another fine example of traditional family values. This is Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 and 29, just so that the audience doesn't think I'm making this up. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin 
and lay hold on her and lie with her, that is, have sex with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, Ooh. and she shall be his wife. Because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. Here we have a case in which a woman is forced to marry her rapist. Mm -hmm. I do not consider that good family values. To say that she has been humbled, that's not true. She's a victim. There's no humility on what she has done. He's the guy who did what was wrong. Mm -hmm. But whereas in anything, is there about real morality in which it should say a man ought not to rape virgins, and certainly that woman should not be forced to marry her rapist. Mm -hmm. Is this traditional family values? <laughs> not in my book. Now, the traditional family values that are talked about currently mm -hmm. is uh, referring to the pattern set up in Genesis, you know, where the woman is the helpmeet and mm. the man is in charge, so forth and so forth. Yes. And uh, that's not working out too well in today's world. Well, I, I should point out, I criticize the Old Testament, and I point out that a lot of this is quite immoral as well as mm -hmm. foolish. But I do want to point out that in saying all of this, I'm not criticizing 20th century Jews. There's nothing about this that mm -hmm. is anti-Semitic. And in fact, I've met many, many atheists. Mm -hmm. I have never met even a single example of anti-Semitism from them, mm -hmm. but I've sure met it in Christians. Mm -hmm. the fact I, think, that I think the reason for that is that we're all very much concerned about the radical right Christian mm -hmm. coalition yes. that is trying to take over our government. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're very concerned about the radical mm -hmm. right Christians. That's right. And the Jews aren't trying to take over the government, so that's, that's not as much of a threat. That's true. And in fact, uh, you're quite right about that. This is why I think it is valuable for us to speak out and point out the absurdities of the Old Testament, not because the Jews are insisting that everybody else live by uh, their rules. Uh, it is the Christians who are the proselytizer, mm -hmm. proselytizers and who want, who want to force, by the use of the secular government, everybody else to follow their religion. Now, it's not as broad as the Christians. Mm -hmm. It's actually the very extremist mm -hmm. right wing and mainstream Christians and mm -hmm. all other sects really are against that takeover. Unfortunately, they do not seem to be very active in or forceful in pointing this out. A lot of them are willing to go along with this. I've talked to more than one person who said, yeah, the extreme right wing are, you're sure, they want to turn this into practically a fascist state, but since they're not a going theocracy. to be successful, uh, then let them just have their way. That's, they that's may have said that with very, Hitler. That's a foolish, uh, yeah. uh, but I'm, I'm involved with the um, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, mm -hmm. and there's a whole coalition of mainstream church people mm -hmm. who are against the radical right uh, uh, Christian coalition well, and that whole good. network. Yeah. Well, power to them. So and I think atheists should work with mainstream they've become Christians. So, they have become so blatant, yes. uh, like political, mm -hmm. that mainstreamers who don't want to live in a theocracy are waking up and starting to uh, uh, coalesce and fight that. Good. That's something that uh, I'm aware of because I'm involved with it. Oh. Well, that's good, and so. I certainly think that atheists should work with uh, uh, Christians towards common goals Absolutely. while still being willing to point out the absurdities of Christian belief. Uh, well, that's part of our entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to admit that. Okay. But certainly, even, even the mainstream Christians, though, very often don't even know what their own Bible says. They're willing to let their ministers and priests mm -hmm. tell them what the what the Bible says, and those ministers and priests will only pick out those parts of the Bible mm -hmm. that suit them. I know, but isn't there a natural glee that comes from, you know, seeing, getting, getting beyond that? Yes, I suppose so. Yes. Uh, but I still think it's, it's valuable that we point out some of these things because, oh. you know, a lot of the, the hatred towards women or, or the fact that women are often put down spring from the Old Testament and oh. the New Testament, even when it's not specifically absolutely, announced. Absolutely, absolutely. The idea of women and children being the property. Yes, exactly so. It's the same as slavery. Yeah. I'll give you another example from uh, the Torah. This is from Numbers chapter 12. 
uh, about the sort of attitude that the Bible sometimes takes towards uh, women. And Miriam and Aram spoke against Moses because he had married an Ethiopian woman. Now, it's not clear here whether they speak against Moses because he's already married, so this is bigamy, or because she's Ethiopian, she's black. It's mm. unclear well, what the problem was, is. There was some uh, um, resistance to the idea of him marrying from another Probably race. So. Okay. But uh, didn't they have, uh, um, they, they didn't have monogamy then. It was No, in fact, there was uh, a lot of so polygamy, that, too. A lot no, of polygamy. It, was, it may have been, uh, it's unclear about that, uh, why, uh, what's the what one, they spoke where, against I, it. I, I, what, what's the one where the women get to have several husbands? I'd Not like in to the vote Bible. for that. Sorry. No, see. <laughs> Try another religion. But that actually wasn't my point. I wanted to continue with this quote because the part that uh, is sort of against women comes a bit later. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and behold, Miriam became leprous. Now, it was both Miriam, the woman, and Aaron, the man who had spoke, but it's only Miriam who gets struck with leprosy. Mm. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Now, this is the Lord himself supposedly saying that if a father spits in his daughter's face, she should be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Now, this is ludicrous. She shouldn't be ashamed. She should be furious. He's the one who should be ashamed. Mm -hmm. And yet, this is the sort of the attitude where the man is always right and, and the woman is property that leads to some of the uh, peculiar attitudes that we find and have found in Well, that started with the creation story in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. where Eve was the one who caused the trouble. Yes. And, you know, nobody ever notices what an idiotic story this is, because what happens, according to the story, is Eve uh, and Adam do not have any knowledge of good and evil. They eat the apple, and that gives them the knowledge of good and evil, and they're punished for it. But here's my question. If they gained knowledge of good and evil only by eating the apple, then why are they being punished for disobeying God? Mm -hmm. Because when they ate the apple, they didn't know what they was wrong been, to disobey they God. Been given, that's right. They didn't know what good and evil was, so, so why are they being punished? Mm -hmm. And in fact, as soon as they do eat it, and they discover they're uh, naked, they cover themselves up, and they try to hide from God. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve, according to the Genesis story, are acting as morally as they possibly can, mm -hmm. and yet they're punished. God, who actually set up this trap for them, right. it's like putting um, a trap. mouse trap with a, a metal spring or a bear claw mm -hmm. in a uh, baby's cage, and then blaming the baby when the baby crawls into it mm -hmm. and gets uh, mm -hmm. killed. So the story itself is nonsensical. But it has a very specific objective. Woman's fault. Right. If all else <laughs> fails, blame the woman. That's right. And I, I should again point out that we're not being anti-Semitic here, that this text was written in the early Iron Age when all civilizations were barbaric. My own ancestors, which ones of them were not Jewish, I have no idea, uh, were as equally barbaric in the behavior as anything we see in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and my ancestors didn't even have enough culture to write things down. So I'm not blaming the, the uh, uh, 20th century Jews for what their distant ancestors did, because mine were equally barbaric. We have to blame the 20th century Christians who want to inflict this on us. Right, and they want to put that into the schools as yeah. fact. Yeah, especially... Uh, the, this ridiculous Now, you trouble teach with science. What is, yes. what is, you teach physics. I teach physics and I teach physical science, which mm -hmm. includes such subjects as astro astronomy and geology. Mm -hmm. And so now, what does that do to a student's mind when they are being taught this as fact, this creation story? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it puts up barriers that are very hard to break down when trying to present them merely with the physical evidence. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, one or two students who didn't even want to look at fossils because these were the devil's tools mm -hmm. made to uh, fool uh, to a human. To discredit the, yeah. the holy book. I suppose so. And you run into that in college, I, students? I have run into that in college. In, in uh, one student in particular, 
I could barely get him to pick up a fossil. He wanted to have nothing to do with this because this was a creation of the devil. And this is in the 20th century? Mm -hmm. But what happens is that I, I think Christians realize how ludicrous their own religion is, so they open up Sunday schools, they drag their kids off to uh, church, and try to force them into this kind of mindset before they have any sense of judgment, mm -hmm. so that by the time they reach an age of maturity and responsibility, their minds have already been so strongly overwritten that you simply can't approach them with any real knowledge. They've got all this mythology in them. Perhaps in a better century than ours, we'll look mm -hmm. on Sunday schools as child abuse, mm -hmm. because loading up innocent children who have no way of protecting themselves with a lot of mythology and ridiculous forms of immorality. That gives them a wrong idea of how to get along in today's yes. world. Yes, it Just does. Just as bad for the male as the female. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, the student who refuses to learn about fossils isn't hurting the fossils, isn't hurting science. That student is hurting himself or herself. Absolutely. And the parents bear some responsibility for this. Uh, well, you know, we, c we can say, how ridiculous, how ridiculous. But there's a very cold, uh, calculated purpose behind all this. Because uh, when you have a woman who is the support system, mm -hmm. For the man, the employer of the man gets a man who has all of these other things done. Mm -hmm. The company is not paying for all those services yes. and getting up, uh, uh, really getting a team for the price of one. Yes, I I don't object to that too much in I the do. sense, well, <laughs> in the sense that, for example, uh, both I and my wife work. Well, that's fine. Yeah. That's not the that's not, not the, the pattern. Yeah. That's not the traditional pattern. That's you true. see, you've already moved beyond mm -hmm. the yes. so-called traditional values, where the woman stays home and raises a half a dozen mm -hmm. to a dozen children, mm -hmm. and does all the work that makes the man free to give all of his energy to the job. I would, I would not mind if our culture said when parents have a child, one of those two parents should stay home for the first five years and keep track of this defenseless newborn. I have no trouble with that, mm -hmm. as long as it is the man as often as the woman. Mm -hmm. Or if it is going to be the woman predominantly, that mm -hmm. she not suffer in any way in her own career and that her work is judged equally valuable. Right. But as it is today, women are penalized for being women, and mm -hmm. that is obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly newborn children, say for the first five years of their they life, are entitled. Some, they are entitled to the protection and mm -hmm. constant attention of a parent right. or both parents, right. but this should not work out to the constant disadvantage of women. There, right. there are easy ways there for this ways to be. There are ways to work these things to out. To work these things well, out. Well, you know, in today's technology, people can work at home. Yes, they can, sure. And often do. And you know, there was a study that was done of women who go to work and women who stay at home and how much time they spend with their children. Mm -hmm. And it turned out it was about equal for both cases. That the women who stayed at home, sure, they were at home, but they didn't pay attention to the child any more than the woman who came home from work mm -hmm. and spent some time with their child. Right. So this traditional family values concept, which, as I pointed out, is not traditional. It's 20th century. The traditional family values is things like selling your um, uh, daughter, spitting on her. Uh, oh. But uh, the traditional family values uh, as, as are now defined, are really, you know, quite fine, but they should Those be... Those aren't the ones that the, we're being preached yes, unfortunately. by the religious right. Okay. Um, so, so anyway, uh, what do you say when people say to you, how do you get along without the Bible uh, as a moral guide, as an ethical guide? Okay. Well, the Bible is not a moral guide. It is a very immoral guide that nobody pays attention to. Our morality is based on the advance of civilization over the years, very often in the teeth of opposition from priests and ministers and rabbis, and that uh, what people are taking 20th century morality in a very restricted sense and saying, oh, that's, that's what the Bible says. But the Bible doesn't say anything like that. In fact, I'll give you one last example, if we have the time, I don't mm -hmm. know, of another example of morality in the Old Testament that nobody believes nowadays. Here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18, 19 and 21. 
If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, well, what should we do? Well, some mothers and fathers shouldn't be listened to. You should rebel against them because they're rotten parents mm -hmm. sometimes. But even so, even if the child is being stubborn and rebellious, this is what the Bible says. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the gate of his place, and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. Mm, now, are the capital punishment simply for being stubborn? Mm -hmm. Now, teenagers ought to be stubborn. Mm -hmm. They are learning how to be adults and how trying to, to make their own way, trying to make their own decisions. A bit of stubbornness and rebellion is healthy and good. And yet here we have the Old Testament saying, if a, uh, if a man, uh, if a son does this, stone him to death. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes this, mm -hmm. and yet the Christians are unwilling to point so out these examples. This as the ethical guide. This <laughs> as an ethical guide? I'd rather go along with uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are a bit more honest about their brutalities. Mm -hmm. So when the next time somebody comes to you and says, oh, you can't do that because the Bible says you can't do that, read them Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18, and see if they will agree to perform that act of stoning a man to death or a teenager to death for simply being stubborn. And if they say no, then they, they will have admitted that they themselves the do Bible not believe that the Bible is not a moral guide. It is That's not. murder. That's murder. That's simply That's murder, murder for being for such a thing. Uh, and uh, as I pointed out, the Jews themselves no longer believe such eth yes. such things as guides. Yes. Neither do the Christians, but they won't be honest about it. Uh -huh. They'll say, "Oh, the Bible says these things, mm -hmm. uh, but we won't tell you exactly what. Wow. Therefore, you have to obey us, right. and we'll tell you what the Bible says and uh -huh. how to how to behave." Well, Steve, we could just go on and on. This is so much fun. Thanks so much. Nice to be and, here. And uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, watch for the rest of our programs. We're on every week. And uh, we're on Century Cable Public Access uh, every Sunday morning. So uh, we look forward to being with you again. And hope you'll be with us. Thank you very much. So,